Our program tonight is entitled The Bionic Man, Advancements in Medical Devices. And we could not have a better person <clears throat> to moderate our program. Our moderator tonight is Robin Razor, who is the Executive Director of Duke's Office of Licensing and Venture. Robin's full bio, along with the bios of all of our speakers, can be found on the event webpage. Um, but I'm not, we're not going to go into a lot of depth because we want to reserve time for the content of tonight's program. But let me tell you a little bit about Robin. The Office of License and Ventures mission is to partner with faculty, industry, entrepreneurs, and investors to ensure that Duke's innovation reaches the marketplace and for the marketplace for the benefit of society and to create investments in future innovation. Robin oversees all functions of technology transfer that take place at Duke through the Office of License and Venture. She, <clears throat> she has worked previously with both University of Michigan and the Ohio State University. She has a master's in science in genetics from the Ohio State University and a BS in bacteriology and zoology from Ohio Wesleyan University. Robin is considered a national leader in university-based technology transfer. In short, if you wanna know how to get an idea from the research bench to the marketplace, Robin is your person. And we are so grateful that she is doing that every day at Duke University. Tonight, I'm pleased to turn the Zoom screen and our program over to Robin Razor. Robin? As I'm sharing my screen after David's introduction, I, I feel that I also need to point out as part of my, uh, hopefully you guys can see this now. Is it showing up? Yes, your PowerPoint's yep. up. Um, I should point out that I'm actually a waiting list, Duke waiting list, 1974, uh, which is why. <laughs> so at least I'm finally, uh, Duke finally decided that I was worthwhile to have uh, uh, be part of the organization uh, when I came here about five years ago. Um, what I wanted to do before we start was for the alumni, let you know a little bit about how we're doing in the whole tech transfer area. I mean, very exciting things going on at Duke. This is a little bit of numbers from our fiscal year 20. Um, we do very well in terms of invention disclosures coming in. That's our raw material. Without our faculty, who you're going to hear from tonight, uh, we have nothing. It's, it's really based on the inventive um, minds of our faculty resulting from their research. And then we turn that into uh, patent applications, issued patents. We actually, we do a lot of business in software and non-patented kind of technologies. We're very fortunate that um, we, we do a fair number of agreements. Last year, we had $65 million in revenue. Uh, many of that, much of that came from, from drugs. This year, we are going to top that um, number. Uh, from some exciting things that are happening um, in this year. So we also uh, spun out 17 new companies last year. And it's not necessarily just the number of startups that are important to us, it's the quality of the companies. And the way we define quality is investable. You know, do they, do they get investment from venture or elsewhere? Do they have acquisitions? Do they go public? And already in fiscal year 21, We've had some great successes. Uh, two companies this year, Actis and Phytonics, were acquired. Actis is a gene therapy company based in um, the uh, Triangle area and was acquired by Bayer for $4 billion. I still, I have to say that periodically to believe it. Um, Phytonics, uh, not so much, but a good number for it. It was acquired by Thermo Fisher um, this year. And many of you have heard about our two uh, companies out of engineering that announced last week that they're going public through the, um, this newfangled SPAC process. One is called INQ, which is a quantum computing company. And the other is Evolve, which is a security company, both of them out of the electrical engineering um, department. So very exciting times for Duke in all areas of technology um, seeing our technologies and our companies um, be successful uh, going forward. 
So to that end, what I'd like to do is have our, well, what we may do is one of our speakers is still in surgery. So what I, we might do is have two of our speakers introduce themselves quickly, and then I will turn the gavel over to uh, Ken Gall as the first speaker. So maybe Ken and Shiny, if you want to introduce yourselves. Um, Are you driving? Uh, yeah, no problem. This is Ken. I am not driving, but I am in a car. <laughs> That's a long story. Um, but I'm Ken Gall. Uh, happy to be here and uh, excited to present for you all. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, and I so I teach mechanical engineering, and I do research on 3D printing of biomaterials. And then Shiny. Hi, I'm Shiny Vargis. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering, materials, <laughs> mechanical engineering, and orthopedic surgery. I just came to Duke the four years back. Before that, I was at UC San Diego. I work in biomaterials, regenerative medicine, and smart devices. Okay, so I'm going to now uh, give the gavel to Ken, and then I will be watching the chat room um, to see if I can keep, get, keep track of any questions that you all might have. All right, thank you very much, Robin. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in a car, uh, I'm not driving, so don't worry, it's not like the surgeon who was on a Zoom call doing surgery. Uh, so glad to be here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we reconstruct the body through 3D printing. Uh, next slide, please. So just real quickly, I have a couple of disclosures. I do have equity ownership in a couple of these businesses. Uh, so we'll talk about university research, but how we translate that a little bit into uh, startup businesses. And most of the stuff I'll talk about today will be from a company called Restore 3D, which I founded while I was at Duke. Uh, next slide, please. So you can play those videos. So if you don't know what 3D printing is, 3D printing is essentially a way to build a three-dimensional object uh, from a fundamental uh, kind of quantity. So the left is laser-based powder bed fusion of titanium. So you can build a three-dimensional object out of titanium uh, directly from powder. And the right, which you can also play, is a uh, SL, that's a, that's a laser-based uh, polymer 3D printing process where you can build a polymer object. It looks like the polymer gets pulled right out of the liquid, but it's a laser curing the plastic. Um, and you can make very, very complex shapes with 3D printing, and then you can use these shapes to try to help make uh, patient-specific implants. Uh, next slide, please. So the first question is, you know, where, where might you use these types of things? And I'm just going to touch briefly on a bunch of these, but you can actually use 3D printing to build things all over the body. Um, and so we're working on things spanning all the way up from the from airway to cervical spine, all the way down to foot and ankle. Uh, next slide, please. One of the real key things that we use 3D printing for is if you look at uh, a standard metallic implant, it's, you know, a solid metal. And the problem with a solid metal is it has nowhere for the bone or the tissues to ingrow. And you'll see later that Shiny works on materials that are also, you know, try to get bone or other tissues to, to grow and attach to the things we put in. But with 3D printing, we can make these implants highly porous. And this porosity allows the implants to work in concert with bone and attach themselves to bone. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, you can see that if you have a very smooth surface, this is just an example of a, of a plot. Uh, where you have a very, very smooth surface, the smooth surface will barely stick itself to bone. This would be like a K wire or a very simple metal. If you move all the way up, you get a factor of about 20 improvement with a porous structure and how well it sticks to bone. Uh, next slide, please. So just going to talk about a couple of the things we do and then leave it at that. Uh, we do spinal reconstructions. I'm actually down here about to meet with a spine surgeon uh, to talk about this. This is why I'm in a car. Uh, I don't have a spot to be before I meet with the surgeon. Um, but we, for example, the old spinal fusion cages were just metal blocks that would, you'd go in, you'd have back pain, they'd take out the disc and they'd put this metal block in there and then try to get the two vertebrae to fuse together. We now can make a metal block that's porous and that porous structure helps the bone fuse those two vertebrae together in a way that actually uh, incorporates with the bone rather than just space puts a spacer between the bone. Uh, next slide. 
you can do some even, even more amazing things. So if you look at orthopedic oncology, this is a really tough case uh, where a, a very large tumor uh, resection in the pelvis. Uh, so you see this, this young patient, this is a 19 year old patient, lost half their pelvis. Um, and the problem is if you're gonna lose half your pelvis like that, you're gonna have to either have an amputation in your leg or have a flail reconstruction. Um, and there's some other things you can try to do to salvage that, but especially for a very young active patient, uh, they don't want that. And uh, what we've been able to do now with 3D printing is you can take the contralateral scan of the other half of the pelvis and rebuild the pelvis with titanium. Um, and this titanium will then has porosity and things to integrate itself with what's left of the pelvis. So this patient was a patient who probably wouldn't have walked and they were able to walk five days after surgery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's another one, trauma. Uh, this is why I'm not driving in the car right now. This is from an automobile accident. Um, this is a person who, they, when, they were si when their car was hit from the side, they lost the bottom part of their, their femur. Uh, it was shattered. But what's really kind of weird about this case was their knee joint was completely intact. So they weren't really, they didn't want to get a knee replacement. They wanted to, you know, just try to salvage just that part of the bone that was above. So we're able to 3D print a, a device that actually made it exactly to the remaining parts of their knee and then ta the tailored itself right up to the rest of their tibia and then has porosity all along that to try to get the bone to grow in there. And the idea is that that implant and the, and the patients, they live in kind of harmony then. The, the implant is then integrated with the patient. And Shiny will talk a lot about the type of materials that go inside of these implants to help make that happen. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a slide or two more. Uh, there's other issues in like uh, lower extremities. There's a thing called Taylor uh, navicular necrosis. And this is where your talus dies. It sounds really random, but it's just the bone in your talus essentially is, has lost blood supply. It dies, it disintegrates and you've lost a bone in there. And, and there's really not a good solution for this other than amputation or losing a couple inches of height and some type of fusion. So we now can actually rebuild a talus for the right half if the patient lost the, by using the contralateral side on the left side of the patient. And you can build this talus that integrates with the bone on the bottom, but then has a very smooth surface on the top to interface with either a total joint or with the native bone on the tibia. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is also some other things you can start to think about other things. So you can design these 3D imprinted implants to, to actually give away. Um, so in one way, you want them to integrate with the body. So you design them to integrate with that, with that porosity. But you also can actually design them to release drugs and do things. Because you can put internal channels and reservoirs and things inside, uh, this is an exciting project. We had a Duke that we just licensed into our startup where we have reservoirs filled with drugs so that if you have an infection or have something else that's going to happen or you think will happen, you can actually load these implants with drugs ahead of time. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a quick thing on some softer materials. We're looking at softer polymers. Those were all titanium and cobalt chrome, very high strength metals. Uh, we're looking at areas like pulmonology where you need a very soft 3D printed scaffold. If someone has, for example, cancer and that's, that's kind of pressing into their airway, uh, you need to be able to hold that open. And people traditionally use stents there. We've been able to 3D print stents that actually fit exactly along that uh, airway passage. And then because of that, they, they match the anatomy and they don't move, which is the biggest problem with stents in the airway. Uh, next slide. We're also in the gynecology area. So looking at soft, this is right now we're working on, we have a project with UPMC uh, uh, Hospital and one of the thought, one of the leaders in uh, pelvic organ prolapse. So this is a really serious problem uh, in female health. So you end up with, with, with organs that um, are prolapse and then you need some type of mesh. There's been a bunch of litigations in this space because the meshes are very, very rigid. Uh, and they tend to tear through the tissue and there's a lot of, of those have stopped being used. And we've been working on 3D printing something that's just as strong as the normal meshes that are used in pelvic organ prolapse, but are much softer. So they can actually cradle and hold the organs and things and not rip through the tissue. 
And we're able to do that by 3D printing complex structures in sort of a mesh fashion. The other problem with a normal mesh is that the, the, it normally closes. So when the organs push on the mesh, the, the knitted mesh will close, but we can design it so that the 3D printed scaffold does not close and the pores stay open. Uh, next slide, please. I think I'm almost done here. Last one I'll mention is orthopedic oncology. We've been, or sorry, uh, uh, just normal oncology in the, in the breast area. We've been looking at, uh, can we replace, so if you think of a lumpectomy where you have part of your breast tissue re uh, removed in a, in a cancer situation, you actually, right now people put markers in there that are titanium and have very rigid. And this, so this not only fills the space, but it provides a target for radiation. We can now 3D print and, and try to replace just the exact breast tissue that was taken out and then have that breast tissue replaced by something that's much softer and shaped exactly what was missing when, when the lumpectomy was performed. Uh, next slide. So I'll stop there. I was to, I, I, hopefully that was right or not too far off time. Um, I'm sorry I'm in a car, uh, but <laughs> it's a, hopefully it was still interesting for you all. And I'll pass this on to Shiny. I believe, and I think Nandan's not next, right? Okay, I need to know Chase Ken. <laughs> that is a hard task. Uh, anyway, today I'm going to talk about some of our effort in the lab. Uh, mainly we focus on creating platforms and approaches to advance health, and some of them connected to what at least somewhat related to what Ken just mentioned. Uh, so the research in our lab, one area is regenerative medicine. Uh, that is where we are looking at how we can create formulations that promote uh, cell function. For example, if you want to create a bone in growth, how we can recruit the cells, make them to differentiate into osteoblasts, that is the bone forming cells, and take shape and function. So in this case, we, you see it's a lung organoid. Here we are using the stem cells to form a lung organ. And here this is a skeletal muscle and this is creating bone forming cells from a, uh, stem cells. We also use the same technology, how the cells interact with these systems to understand uh, the disease formation or the disease progression. And in that case, we focus on cancer metastasis and fibrosis. And moving forward, we create a number of uh, therapeutic in, uh, interventions. And in one case, we looked at how we can change the tissue environment to target fibrosis. Other phase uh, is a bone fracture healing and treating osteoporosis and the cell transplantation for a, a diabetes or for any cell, uh, like or a liver, etc. And another one is aging. How do the aging influence uh, delayed fracture healing or in the case of a uh, brain inflammation for a, an Alzheimer's disease? And we also have an interest in uh, creating smart materials and technologies like self-healing hydrogels, soft robot, organ on a chip platforms, etc. So in the regionality medicine space, uh, we create tissue-specific biomimetic material then we use it as a platform or a tool to study the molecular mechanism, identify new therapeutic targets, and see how we can support in situ tissue repair. Uh, in fact, first I'm going to talk about mimicking bone tissues. So if you take uh, and look at the bone tissue, you see a number of hierarchical structures and different aspects within the tissue. And we are interested in mimicking the extracellular uh, material and especially the calcium phosphate mineral. So we have created a biomaterial that uh, mimic this calcium phosphate mineral present in the bone tissue. So you have calcium and phosphate, and we use this material to study bone health disease and fracture healing. In fact, these studies has led to a creating a biomaterial uh, which uh, provides calcium and phosphate. So you have a cell that sees this calcium and phosphate. They activate a number of signaling pathways and finally get into something which is a biomolecule that is adenosine. The, when you generate adenosine, that promote bone formation while inhibiting fat formation. So we started looking at the possibility of using adenosine or the adenosine signaling 
as a therapy for bone fracture healing and prevent fat formation. I, in fact, we have devised a biomaterial formulation to harness endogenous adenosine to heal bone tissue. And in fact, this is the boronic acid imbibed with a biomaterial that complex with the adenosine and form this complex. And this is the therapeutic formulation. So someone has a fracture now, so a broken. So we can inject this biomaterial along with the therapy into the bone site and we can watch healing. Uh, in fact, this technology is patented where we can either deliver the adenosine or sequester the adenosine in vivo. And this is a uh, animal studies where this is the control where there is no therapy and this is two different doses of adenosine. This is lower dose and this is higher dose. And we are looking at bone formation after a fracture. And you can see that with the therapeutic formation, uh, sorry, when we use the therapeutic formulation, we see higher bone formation. And this is also connected with the vascularization. So when we use this therapeutic formulation, we also see more blood supply to the injured site, uh, create recruiting stem cells, differentiating them into bone forming cells and improving the, uh, in the healing process. Uh, not only that it uh, promotes healing, it also uh, mitigate fracture pain. In fact, here we are looking at the ADO means the therapeutic formulation and the other one is the control. We are looking at the ability of the animal to walk or stand on their fractured uh, leg. And you see that uh, they can put more weight when we have treat them with this uh, uh, injectable material formulation. Uh, we also now repurpose the same formulation to treat osteoporosis. As you all know, osteoporosis is characterized by bone loss. And uh, the current therapy is a bisphosphonate-based drugs. They prevent bone loss. They don't help forming the bone. So we started looking at creating a new drug in the space, uh, which can decrease the bone resorption. That means it can prevent the bone loss, but also promote the bone formation. So you have an anabolic function, not just preventing the catabolic function. So in this, uh, article we have established this concept and then moving forward we have created a nano carrier uh, that has a bone targeting site so when you inject them into the animal systemic in injection they go and bind to the bone then we have this drug loading uh, arms which releases the drug uh, and we have looked at the bone forming ability of this treatment and here this is the control that means we have a healthy animal then we have a osteoporotic animal, then the osteoporotic animal treated with the nano carrier. Then this is the one where the osteoporotic animal treated with the drug formulation. And I'm just going to show you that if you compare the all groups, you can see when you look at the bone mineral density, that is the, the bone formation, you can see that the healthy and the treated one is very similar. Similarly, bone volume, that is another parameter we look at for bone formation. Uh, trabecular number, the other feature, trabecular thickness, connective tissue. These are a bunch of parameters that we assess to find out the bone formation. And you can see that when we have this therapeutic formulation that is very similar to the control, that is the healthy one. Uh, now, in the second arm, we also, as I said, we have interest in creating smart materials. So one of our interest in creating self-repairing or self-healing biomaterials. So first we have created the self-healing hydrogels. Uh, in order to create the self-healing hydrogels, we have introduced this dangling side chain that allows us to take this hydrogel. So this is how, this is more like a jelly jello, uh, which we can make them heal or unheal by just changing the pH. And here you can see this is the three hydrogel pieces that are healed together. This is a uh, this is a number of hydrogel pieces that you see are connected to each other or healed together. And in this case, this is a three piece hydrogel. They are hooked to each other and you can see that they are very strongly held so they can uh, stick to each other. And in fact, this video shows the self healing material. Uh, so this is us generated. Then we move into this solution, which has a low pH. And you can see that as soon as they stick to 
each other, they just heal. So we can stretch them. In this case, we are repeatedly. Uh, we are repeatedly uh, stretching them and you can see that they stick to each other and they don't break. Now using this type of engineering principles, uh, we are creating self-healing lubricants. In this case, we have made uh, hyaluronic acid based hydrogels to heal. Uh, so when they can improve the retention within the joint and also we are investigating the ability of this self-healing lubricants to treat cartilage injury. And this is a material which can form a physical cross-linking. They will stick to each other, self-healing, self-repairing, and then we can extrude them. And this is the data showing that this is a healthy uh, cartilage, and this is the modified lubricant. And you can see that the better contraprotection when we treat them with the modified HA, and this is the conventional HA. Um, so as I said, we show all this data in a uh, mice. And in fact, this is a super mice. And I always amused with this code. If you have cancer and you're a mouse, we can take uh, good care of you. The same way we treat the mouse. So we now started looking at creating humanized chips. So we can also look at how these therapeutics can be used to treat disease or model diseases. Here we can create a various organs from the human and we can connect them. It's more like a Lego, so we can move them, add them, etc. And this is a vascularized liver tissue. Uh, this is a beating heart, so we can look at how the drug responds. And this is a cancer where we are looking at the interactions. And this is lung on a chip, which we are using to study SARS-CoV-2 infection and also cancer metastasis into the liver. This is a blood-brain barrier on a chip where we are looking at neuroinflammation and brain imaging. And finally, my lab has some interest in multifunctional soft robot. And this is a soft robot that was created to detect the temperature and also water acidity and also otherwise contaminations. And I would just leave you with this showing that the soft robot can move, detect the things and change their uh, movement by taking a sharp turn or taking a complex motion. With that, I would like to give all the credit to my students. Uh, they make me look way better by doing all these researches. And with that, I leave. And thanks a lot for listening. And I will next to give it to Nandan. Nandan, you're up. Okay, sorry. Uh, thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Shiny? Yep. You're the only one on video. Yep. All right, perfect. All right, thanks, everyone. Let me share my screen. Sorry, I was in the OR late today here at Duke Hospital. And let me pull up my slides. All right, so uh, name is Nandan Ladd. I'm uh, Vice Chair of Innovation and in Department of Neurosurgery here at Duke, and also have an appointment in um, mechanical engineering. And I wanted to share my perspective on the bionic man in terms of innovations in functional neurosurgery, which is my area of subspecialization. And there's a lot to cover uh, in the 10 minutes we have. So I just wanted to share a few of the procedures that we do routinely that really um, serve to modify or enhance the function of the nervous system, hence the name functional neurosurgery. And so deep brain stimulation is one procedure that you may have heard of, uh, or DBS for short. It's most commonly used for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia are the three main FDA approved indications currently. But as our understanding of the brain circuitry expands and as imaging improves, we can start to see these fiber tracks or circuits and potentially modulate how those circuits um, work and how they can be strengthened over time in the case of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. And so the brain is an amazing organ. I'm sure um, you know, you've seen pictures, but it's, it's amazing to see up front in person. And uh, the brain stem is sort of the core um, 
uh, reptilian brain, if you will, but has all the core functions uh, that we rely on on a daily basis. And this is a human brainstem uh, that we dissected here in the anatomy lab. And so this is the view that we're starting to see. So rather than just as a static structure, is it's a bundle of these different circuits uh, or connections between one area of the brain and the other. And as we start to you know, understand how these circuits work, where they connect from one region to another, I think the ability to uh, have targeted surgical or interventional procedures that modulate these circuits and enhance uh, our function or restore our function after a stroke, with Alzheimer's disease, with a lot of these things that have been relegated to neurology, uh, it's my uh, hope that over the next 20, 30 years, uh, we'll have solutions uh, for many of these conditions and that Duke will play a big part of it. So in terms of circuitry, this is a simple circuit uh, called a tremor circuit. And so this is a procedure I did actually one just earlier today is a deep brain stimulator for essential tremor. And it's usually, usually a benign condition where patients have worsening tremor over time. Certainly it's medically managed for many years, but at some point uh, it becomes very disabling to their daily quality of life. And I think we have some videos and the circuit here is the dentato rubrothalamic tract or DRT tract for short that we're modulating with the stimulator. And so this is sort of how we're starting to view uh, the circuitry that we're starting to um, selectively stimulate and intervene on, as you can see here. So it's deep in the brain, hence the name deep brain stimulator. So eight centimeters deep in the brain. And we're targeting a very small structure, usually on the order of three to five millimeters. And so that's the precision. Uh, every millimeter matters uh, that we need when we're targeting these fine uh, fiber tracks. Obviously we want to maximize the benefit while minimizing the side effects. And so this is a zoomed in version of what that looks like uh, at you know, higher resolution. And so the proximity of the electrode to the uh, DRT tract, in this case for essential tremor, uh, directly correlates with efficacy in terms of improvement of tremor. This is a patient, I think you can see here that um, his tremor uh, there on the left part of your screen is quite disabling um, in terms of his day-to-day -day functions and um, had been medically managed for many years and then underwent uh, deep brain stimulation. Can you put both hands out straight in front of you? With your right hand, can you slowly bring it up to your mouth? And some of you may have seen videos like this, but um, some of you may not have. And how about with your left hand? Can you put that straight up? And I think it just really demonstrates the dramatic impact can you uh, put both hands an existing procedure can do in functional neurosurgery. Good. With your right hand, can you slowly bring it up to your mouth? So he's rock solid now. Great. And this was only a month post-op. He's now... Like five years post up and, and continuing to do great. And so some of the uh, new directions, uh, if you will, in DBS and navigation is current steering. So for the last 20 plus years that DBS has been around, it's just been a ball of energy, uh, if you will, a sphere of energy that is emitted from that electrode. And now we have the ability to contour that field. So if you want to direct the current north or east or west or south and you know, have different shapes so that you're stimulating some circuits while avoiding other circuits, that's not possible. And that's a relatively new innovation just in the last one to two years. And now has become quickly the standard of care in this area of neurosurgery. And so structural connectomics, you know, this is sort of our way of saying if, you know, the human, uh, if the globe is the human brain and we're interested in going to Duke University, um, you know, it's similar to that tremor circuit. It's a six millimeter target that we're trying to to hit with uh, submillimeter precision. But there's a lot of other structures around Duke University that are, <laughs> that are really important in terms of what we're stimulating and what connections we're strengthening. And functional connectomics rather than structural connectomics is that each of these, just like all of us, we're all connected. Each part of the brain is connected. And you can look at it, whether it be the, the rail map of North Carolina or the nonstop flights from RDU, however you like to think about it. But by modulating one part of that circuit, you're affecting many other parts of the circuit as well. And so that's something we're just starting to understand uh, better as imaging has improved and looking at how that circuit modulation occurs. One of the clinical trials we'll be a part of here at Duke is uh, deep brain stimulation for Alzheimer's disease. And in that case, it's the memory circuit and we're stimulating in the front of the brain at the fornix and that modulates the hippocampus, which is at the tail end of that circuit. 
So exciting times for sure. This is just another view of, of that. This is a one cubic millimeter of tissue, of brain tissue, showing how when you expand in on that, just like the globe uh, analogy I gave, there's 50,000 neurons and a billion uh, plus synapses that are concentrated in that one cubic millimeter of tissue. And so I think the ability of current steering is one step forward, but still, um, as you look at a broader view of what that circuit looks like, uh, there's a lot to learn and uh, I'm excited about uh, the coming years that we can contribute to this. Uh, spinal cord and peripheral nervous system is another broad area of functional neurosurgery in terms of how we modulate that. And you know, to be uh, very succinct about it, uh, there's 31 different nerve roots. Each of these are connections as you go from the brain to the rest of the body. Uh, and each of these cables is um, something that we rely on. And certainly we realize when something goes awry, whether that's sciatica, or trigeminal neuralgia, which is another surgery I was just doing today. And so each of these nerves can be affected and any one of them can lead to debilitating pain or other serious neurologic conditions. And so one common procedure we do is spinal cord stimulation, uh, which in the spirit of the bionic man is, a, is also an implanted device. Essentially, instead of a brain pacemaker, it's a pain pacemaker uh, that's implanted over the spinal cord. This is a very simple type of device uh, with two electrodes connected to very similar technology as the uh, deep brain stimulator and cardiac pacemakers. And the main innovations in this area have been around software, the frequency of stimulation, and expanding the types of indications that can be treated with spinal cord stimulation. Again, our understanding of the spinal cord anatomy is improving. Um, I showed you know, those nice uh, images of the brain circuitry. We're not quite there yet in terms of spinal cord circuitry. We still have these sort of uh, cartoon diagrams, if you will, of the different regions of the spinal cord. But within each of these regions, there's tens of thousands of neurons that are critical and having that level of specificity, we just don't have yet. But I think that we will uh, be moving in that direction over the coming years. One step in that direction is using the type of energy that is selective for certain types of neurons and stimulating that way. So stimulating neurons in the dorsal horn as shown in the middle there. Uh, with a higher frequency stimulation versus lower frequency is more the, the uh, dorsal part of the spinal cord and the dorsal columns, and then combining those frequencies for different types of pain conditions. And so these are three big clinical trials we've been a part of, painful diabetic neuropathy, non-surgical refractory back pain, and complex regional pain syndrome uh, that I think will rapidly expand the indications and the patients that can benefit from spinal cord stimulation. In terms of where this field is going, closed loop spinal cord stimulation is uh, relatively new in the past year, where a given we change body positions from sitting to standing and how we regulate what is stimulated and how it's stimulated is now possible uh, with that closed loop feedback. And then finally, the last procedure I'll share is something called the dorsal root entry zone or DREZ procedure. It was pioneered here at Duke back in the 70s and is something that still uh, we get referrals from all over the country for, for targeted uh, ablations, if you will, uh, when that circuit goes awry. So rather than implanting a device, like in the first two examples of deep brain stimulation and spinal cord stimulation, this is sort of like uh, the fuse box in your house and sort of resetting that fuse box very specifically uh, where that uh, nerve has been damaged. You know, this patient had a brachial plexus avulsion, which is highlighted there in the white, where the nerve root is actually severed from the spinal cord. This is usually from a high velocity accident, like a motorcycle accident or speedboat or something similar. Um, are the patients I've treated recently. And you know, this is what the spinal cord looks like. And, and maybe this isn't for everyone, but uh, you know, I think seeing the anatomy in, in uh, real life under the microscope is always um, amazing. So on the one side is the, the, the nerve roots that's shown by the suction. And on this side in the orange is where they're missing. And you can see that opening there where that evolved segment is. And we sort of interrupt that uh, with a targeted lesion. And where this is going is again, high resolution imaging. And so this is the highest resolution map, if you will, of the spinal cord that uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Al Johnson here at Duke uh, to build. So it's one micron resolution of the human spinal cord and something that again, will be a step in that direction of imaging uh, more specifically what those fiber tracks and connections are uh, between one area uh, and another. And so with that, um, you know, uh, the future is bright. Everyone hears about Neuralink and Elon Musk, and a lot of people ask me, when is this happening? And you know, I think it, it'll happen uh, soon in our lifetime. 
But there's a lot of other types of brain machine interfaces like deep brain stimulation or spinal cord computer interfaces like spinal cord stimulation that we do every day. And so Neuralink is certainly a very exciting and has a, another order of magnitude of precision using uh, robotic techniques and very thin filaments uh, to help people that uh, currently can't move and are in wheelchairs to communicate. And I think uh, that's really exciting and, um, and looking forward to seeing how that unfolds. So with that, thanks for your time and attention. So um, I think we'll do, and thank you to all of you who have um, posted questions and we're gonna try and um, ask a couple of them uh, to each person. Um, so first um, with Ken, I'm just gonna ask you two questions and you can answer them however you want. Um, the first one is if you have a MRSA infection that has had trouble with orthopedic hardware, is there any implant that can avoid exaggerating the infection? And then the second one, is are there major changes in the rehab process or um, functional outcomes after the types of surgical um, interventions that you've demonstrated? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, as far as the first question, uh, the answer is yes. So there's a lot of work being done on coatings for orthopedic implants that, or other implants that would try to really uh, you know, prevent infections or reduce the severity of them. And then we are working on things where you know, we can use the implant in the open spaces in the implant to actually store drugs that may treat infection. So this is a big issue. Uh, there, you know, implants do make infections worse often if you have a type of infection. And so that is something that's happening. Um, and then the second one is on the rehab protocol. And, you know, I think that's behind right now. So to be honest, I think we're you know, even I had surgery on my arm two years ago, for example, and the rehab protocols, even for that, were, you know, behind a little bit the times. And I think that they're probably behind the times for these types of newer reconstructions. So that's a great area of probably of, of work to be done. In my view, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, next for, for Shiny, how far out do you see some of these bone growth technologies before they'll start you know, being used in the clinic or in patients? They are mostly in animal studies, which is very effective. Uh, so they are all small animal studies like mice. So maybe go to a larger animal before we go to a clinical trial. And then a bit of a corollary, how much does the chip-based technology accelerate the development of some of these new therapies? That the drug discovery space, the organ on a chip is going to make a big difference. Uh, in fact, already FDA started using some of them uh, because it, it doesn't replace the animal studies, but it build, it build a gap between the cell cultures with the animal studies. So you can get to whether the drug works in a human specific condition. So yeah, that screen, they are heavily used. Okay, thanks. And then for Nand and a, a couple, um, has any deep brain stimulation been done with respect to primary progressive aphasia? And then the second is, are there any prospective use of DBS to treat depression? Yeah, no, great question. So, I mean, language is critical and amazing. And I think our understanding of syntax, of consonants, vowels, how we put words together is evolving rapidly. So um, some of our colleagues um, across the country, as well as here at Duke, um, our first patient today participated in a research study actually in the operating room, looking at different syntax and putting together consonants and vowels. And so it's a step in the right direction of understanding how the brain processes uh, those components of language to help patients with problems like aphasia to communicate uh, using uh, brain uh, computer interfaces. Uh, the second question around depression, um, there have been several large clinical trials, actually probably about 10 years ago now, looking at medication refractory depression. Uh, the challenge is, I think, twofold. So they didn't meet their primary endpoint, uh, is the short version. But the longer version is that imaging is not as good as it was today. The targeting wasn't standardized in terms of submillimeter precision, like I showed you. You know, if you're off by a couple of millimeters, that's a big deal. <laughs> and you're not stimulating the circuit that you think you're stimulating. And so there's a lot of variability and heterogeneity in how people were placing those electrodes and what they thought they were stimulating versus what they were actually stimulating when they went back and looked at the imaging. And then I think also the patients that uh, get selected for, you know, large uh, trials like that for depression are 
you know, challenging. They've failed five medications, they failed ECT, and they expect their primary endpoint to meet efficacy at three months. And so I think that's a tall order for any therapy. And so having a longer time, time horizon uh, in terms of um, what the therapy can do over time or expanding that to patients maybe earlier in their disease course, like they're doing with Alzheimer's disease, earlier mild cognitive impairment are the, the primary patients that are being enrolled for that study. Right. Um, back to Ken, in, in some of these, these typical, well, I don't know what, <laughs> a lot of your stuff is not typical. How long does the printing, you know, can you walk them through sort of the, you know, from the beginning to the end, the printing process, how long does that take? Yep. So there's, it takes a couple hours to load the printer up and get it all ready to go for, we'll, we'll take a metal implant, which is the longer a couple hours sometimes to load and unload it, all the processing, the actual print, if it was a full pelvis, that would probably take a day or two. Wow. Um, if it was just, you know, a whole bunch of small implants or a, you know, like a, like a, let's say a, a replacement for a part of your finger or something like a scaphoid, that would probably take a, you know, hour or two. Um, and then the instruments print in about 12 hours. So it's a, it's a longer, longer process, but you can run them all in parallel so that it's a very low cost process because you don't have to be sitting there doing anything. It's just happening. So no one has to, can they be run, you know, overnight? Does someone have to yep. watch the machine at all times or? They do not. Yeah, they're all now monitored by web. So you can watch them on webcam and stuff, so, you know, to make sure it's working, but they're all instrumented. It just happens. There's no, no one's, it's just the removal of the implants takes some time, but that's it. For those of you alumni who haven't been back in a while, there's this wonderful facility at Duke called the CoLab um, that has a whole bunch of 3D printing machines. And, uh, you know, the students can send stuff from their, um, uh, dorms. It's, it's a great place to visit if, if you haven't uh, seen it. Um, so some and, and wondering... Robin, if, if you don't mind, I'll say one thing and, and, and more than welcome to come visit the restored facility too, which is also on is close to Duke's campus. So the collab is an awesome place to visit and we can also show the metal printers at restored. So yeah, there, it, it's, it's really an interesting place. I have a question here, but I'm not even sure who it's for. It says retinal or optic nerve machine interfaces for sight restoration. Who is this for? No, so Man Mandan. 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 <laughs> <laughs> My wife is an ophthalmologist here at Duke, Noralad. So she tells me a little bit about the innovations happening in, in that area of the world and, and retina is her specialty actually. So there have been different uh, retinal prosthetics um, for retinitis pigmentosa and other conditions. Um, there are also things looking at stimulating the occipital cortex uh, in, in patients to, to try to restore some you know, hand motion and you know, uh, basic vision. Um, I think uh, those are still in clinical trials. Um, and so the, the cost and the time required is, is a lot, but it's important you know, for patients that uh, need to recover vision, but, but still in trials. And then we have, and Shiny, this one's a pretty detailed one. Um, do you use a control group that consumes a similar quantity of boron and adenosine? Yes, we have multiple controls. So we use either with the complete formulation or partial formulation with the carriers. Yeah, so yes, in short, yes. Okay, love it. And then I guess in the little bit of time we have left, um, do any of you want to comment about, um, I, I guess I would say I've seen in the last five years that I've been at Duke, I mean, one of the wonderful things about Duke is that we're still, you know, while we're a big university from a health system perspective, we're still a small university in terms of location. And can you talk a little bit about how you all have met each other or the interactions, how easy it is to walk across campus from engineering to medicine, or if there's things about Duke that make it special to you in your innovation process? Anybody who wants to, to answer? I, I can say something quick and then let the others sit. I, you know, I moved from Georgia Tech to Duke and, you know, work with both Shiny and Nand and some, and then a lot of other, the, the proximity, you know, there's two things that are important for me, the proximity of the people there at, at the hospital has been just absolutely incredible. So, you know, that has really helped. We can get together for meetings. Obviously that's been a little different the past year, 
Um, but that has been incredible. But that's probably a you know 10% factor. The 90% is that the surgeons are just absolute innovators. I mean, it's been pretty amazing to work with them and and really they, they want to pioneer areas and you know not take excessive risk, but really just go after the newest technologies that can really make a difference with patients. And I've just not seen that anywhere else that I've been. And and there's a pretty good tech transfer office person too. So <laughs> That's been that's been helpful. Yeah. Nandan, I mean, as one of the surgeons, I, I think the other advantage is you can walk. I, I, one of the things I love about walking on campus is seeing, you know, docs walking across over to engineering and vice versa. You know, it, it's it's just really coming from a much bigger university, University of Michigan. That didn't happen. You had to drive everywhere, and just um, watching those kinds of um, you know people just walking back and forth. Now, whether or not you ever get off out of the OR to actually walk across the street and see Ken is another issue, but. I do, I do. So yeah, my background, I was at Stanford before coming to, to Duke 10 years ago. And, you know, very similar in terms of strong university, strong medical center and close proximity. And that's one of the things that attracted me to come to Durham. And um, like Ken said, it's very collaborative. Uh, engineering is very strong. Uh, that collaboration helps um, move projects forward. Uh, we work with Ken on a bunch of different projects in, in the medical device space. And um, yeah, and I think you've been a big asset in terms of changing the mindset, honestly, to uh, a progressive uh, technology forward. How do we get these things to patients, which is the ultimate goal uh, of all of these innovations? Well, we, I think we only have, and, and Shiny, you're the newest person here. I don't know if you want to make any comments about how you've seen it since you arrived. Any I agree with Ken and Nandan. Huh? I agree with both Ken and Nandan. And then one last question, I think then I'm going to get uh, the, the hook. Um, do any of you want to comment on, on how the advancements in, in gene and cell therapy impact, you know, the future of your areas of research? For the alumni on here, you, you should know that we are developing and are very, very strong in both gene therapy and cell therapy. We over the past couple of years have recruited a number of people. We have some of the, the top minds in both of those areas um, and as well as in CRISPR. So there's a lot going on on campus in all of these areas. Um, so it's, it's an exciting time. And, and you know, for a tech transfer person, that's really exciting because that's also hot areas. And so companies and venture continue to come to Duke because of our faculty, but I don't know if you want to comment on how you're using any of or interacting with any of these these researchers in your own uh, research. Shiny, I, I don't... we do some cell therapy mainly for looking at the cells as a drugstore. So, can you transplant the xenogenic cells? For example, can you transplant the pig cells into human and let them secrete insulin? or a factor nine in the case of hemophilia. So we look at how that can be possible. So in that case, yes, we do collaborate with uh, the physicians who are seeing the patients. And yeah, so that is where one of the focus where we, and also in mesangamal stem cell transplantation, where we look at how to control the secretor. Uh, but we have not started collaborating with the gene space. So David, are, are you taking uh, over now? Fantastic. Well, I just, wow. Um, I am encouraged, inspired, a little bit terrified about everything that is possible, but maybe that's because I watch too many sci-fi movies, but um, it is just amazing to hear what is happening. I want to thank Robin Razor um, and each of our panelists for an amazing Duke night. It is such a privilege to kind of step back into the classroom um, and to learn and to be inspired and um, just to be so proud of everything that's happening at Duke. I think we can safely say that every day new possibilities are emerging and Duke has an active hand in many of those extraordinary possibilities. Um, I also wanna share with you, there are still over a dozen sessions like this that are part of the Forever Learning Institute coming up yet this spring. I'm gonna put in the chat um, two web links. One is for 
the course description of all the uh, spring courses for the Forever Learning Institute. There's also a link to the Lifetime Learning YouTube page where ultimately all of these programs are shared with our alumni and you can come back and listen to them later. The next two sessions in advancing the health and wellness track um, look equally amazing. We have Advancing Healthcare with Technology that's gonna be hosted by uh, Pratt Dean Robbie Bellanconda, who is just amazing, and that's going to be on April 16th. We're also going to revisit um, a book we've talked about a bit with alumni before, which is entitled Black Man in a White Coat, with the author, faculty member, and Duke alum, Damon Tweedy. He's going to be in conversation with the Chancellor of Duke Health System, Gene Washington, and that is on May 25th. Um, and so st also stay tuned in July, we'll be announcing the entire fall lineup. So it'll be uh, just like being back at Duke and signing up for classes, you'll be able to sign up for an incredible fall series of programs, um, which will be both inspiring. And I think you will enjoy uh, continuing to learn. And that is our goal that uh, we, we set up an opportunity for, our lifetime, for a lifetime of learning for our alumni. I am so glad you could join us tonight. I wanna to once again, thank our amazing panel. We look forward to seeing you at the next Forever Learning Institute program and to the next Duke alumni um, event that we have planned for you coming up in the next days and weeks. I hope you th that you stay safe, you have a great evening and I wanna wish you a good night. Thank you so much.